Where do we come from? <laughs> uh, to many animists, that question is actually not where do we come from, but who do we come from? And this video is about tr trying to answer that question or beginning to answer that question. It's about ancestry or ancestors. I've already made a kind of randy video uh, that touched the subject, uh, but I was uh, asked to expand on the topic of ancestry, so here we go. Uh, ancestry is a really difficult one, and uh, I'm actually planning, therefore, one of these kind of loosely organized little series here uh, in this video. I'm terribly sorry about that. It might also have be a little bit ranty here and there. But uh, I'll also talk a little bit about a Nordic myth of ancestry, uh, which is the Rikshthula, where the god Heimdall becomes an ancestor of, of humanity. And uh, I promise that in the following videos, I'll, I'll follow up with some more uh, positive reflections and, and ideas. And I think I'll try to look at the Nordic sources on dead cult and ancestry through the ages and relate this to other cultures, such as uh, African ideas that are very closely aligned, in fact, with the European ideas. And and that is the ideas of gods being really dead humans or humans sort of becoming gods when they die. Uh, I think I'll also be looking at Maori ideas about reality as being birthed and therefore all is genealogy in a sense. Reality comes into being uh, by descending from someone. I'll also draw I think on totemism, uh, the idea that we we descend from our genealogy ties us into others in the world, like animals, right? But before I come to all that, there's still a little bit of controversy that I just need to clear the air off a little bit. Um, the topic of ancestry was recently discussed in a Facebook group uh, for discussion related to Nordic animism that I was asked to open and that I opened. Uh, and if you uh, don't belong to the Islamophobic, racist, nationalist sort of end of the spectrum of people who are interested in Nordic religion, then you're invited to participate, right? So uh, it's called Nordic Animism something something and I'll, I'll put a link uh, somewhere in, uh, around this video. Now in this group there was a heated discussion about ancestry uh, and I'll, ret I'll return to it uh, in later videos because some of the, the stuff that these different heathen scholars uh, were saying in there was like really good points. Uh, for instance, um, some very sensible and wise people expressed the idea that uh, the very notion of ancestors is inherently racist uh, and they strongly oppose the idea that uh, ancestry should have any place uh, at all in relation to, for instance, contemporary Nordic heathen religion. Um, but I actually think that proper ancestry is in effect quite oppositional to racism and to these sort of folkist agendas and all that stuff. Um, and the reason I think it think this is because of, uh, because I know it from Afro descendant religions, where you see a very clear opposition. Uh, between a very real presence of ancestors and race nationalism. And, and this is, of course, black race nationalism in this case. It seems that the more nationalist Afro-descendant religions become, the more the dead and ancestors that are strikingly similar to your descendant and ancestor ideas disappear or become problematic or something like that. And I'm aware, of course, that black race nationalism and whiteness and race nationalism aren't the same thing. Uh, also that the existing power structures mean that uh, black race nationalism is more ethically legitimate than uh, white race nationalism. But uh, um, here I'm more thinking about uh, the conceptual structure uh, and there are similarities uh, between these, uh, these nationalisms. They're both race nationalisms. Um, so, and what happens is that these explosively erotic, transgender, trans-ethnic, trans-everything like dead spirits, who are so awesome to hang around with because they're such a party, they tend to decrease in importance or even become problematic as nationalism increases, right? So, probably uh, there is some sort of conflict between the fact that they're so transgressive and so ambiguous uh, 
and, and that this kind of ancestry conflicts with nationalist ideas of ancestry that uh, focus on cultural ethnic purity, right, or something like that. Something like that. So uh, instead you get ancestry seemingly reduced to these focused style sort of elegies about an illustrious distant past and ancestors who were probably mega cultural in a way that was somehow much cooler of our way of being cultural, right? And that's sort of the, the, the tendency among uh, in these Afro-descendant religions. Um, so I don't think that ancestry, it look, doesn't look to me like ancestry is inherently race nationalist at all, actually. Perhaps it's the opposite. And this very intense sort of appropriation of ancestry uh, by nationalists is somehow a key point in the way that we're all being subjected to uh, being mentally colonized by very modernist ideas. Um, and and these, these, by the way, are images from my own research in, in Afro-Brazilian religion uh, in Brazil. Uh, and I'll return in later videos and show more of this amazing real ancestor cult. So, uh, yeah, so I strongly suspect that claiming ownership of ancestry is actually really central for people who want to struggle to create a progressive Eurodescent and contemporary renewal of tradition. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll probably end up structuring my thoughts on this a little bit more as I go along in making these videos. Because I think it is monumentally min misunderstood, actually, by many. And particularly uh, by those, of course, who think with ancestry in unsavory ways, right? Rant begins. <laughs> uh, there is a kind of a halloween -y carnival <clears throat> in the media and vlogs and debaters and stuff who are intensely interested in genetics. But in a way, that's not racist at all. Uh, and they're all over the idea of ancestry, uh, of course. And the problem is that that this whole kindergarten, you know, it, and hold on because here comes an important, important piece of info. They project contemporary ideas on the very distant past. Project contemporary ideas on the very distant past. Such contemporary ideas as whiteness, being white, diversity, specific ethnicities, cultural politics, ideas that are very much uh, part of our time. And any child knows that you cannot unproblematically just project this on the iron of the Viking Age or something like that. But we have a little bit of a tendency to do it because these are kind of ideas that tend to present themselves to us as kind of a parts, given parts of reality is a little bit like the immune system or the digestion or something like that. But being white is not like that, you know. Being white, being diverse, they are social constructions that belong to our time. This skin is not white in color, right? And in the distant past, people weren't white for the simple reason that white is a thing, white as a thing that, that that humans can be or can or not be wasn't invented yet. They may have qualified as white according to our ideas, but not according to their own. Uh, and they also weren't diverse for exactly the same reason. Diverse is our concept. Concept. It is constructed in a certain way. It's about certain things. When we call something diverse, we think perhaps of race, religiosity, gender, sexuality, all these things. And these are our criteria for diversity. Uh, let's talk about Vikings. Vikings probably were diverse in some senses, but not in others. Probably it would not feel diverse at all for a Viking Age nobleman to marry someone from a different ethnic group as long as that person had similar social status. That would be pretty conservative in terms of inclusive, inclusion diversity in that context, probably. But it will probably feel very diverse indeed, perhaps transgressively, impossibly diverse, uh, to marry someone uh, from the same ethnic group, group, but who belong to a lower social class, uh, right? So King Harold the Bluetooth, for instance, would probably have never married 
uh, slave uh, woman, but he act from who uh, belonged to his own ethnic group, but he actually did marry a Slavic noblewoman who belonged to a different ethnic group, right? So we can look at genetics, of course, and we can derive specific kinds of understanding and build specific kinds of knowledge uh, on, on that. Of course we can do that. But we should be very, very cautious when we're slamming our own, con con our own concepts onto prehistoric people. You know. But the worst thing is not that you find like knobheads on the internet that are on fire about Vikings being blonde or not being blonde or being diverse or not being diverse. You know. That's to be expected. The worst thing is that this absolute pseudo-knowledge seems to be kind of unintentionally corroborated by big DNA research on the highest level. Not the results, of course. Uh, of course, genetic research is a fully legitimate science and it can tell specific things. I'm not talking about the results. I'm talking about that when these researchers, uh, when they go into the media, they tend to sort of rhetorically associate their findings with exactly these misconceptions, right? And they sometimes use this language that is like, we can learn who we really are or where we really come from. Uh, and then this is projected into the media, sort of propelled by either explicit or implicit by this misconception of projecting. You know, hooray, the first Ice Age hunters that entered into Sweden were dark-skinned, you know. But Sweden didn't exist before 10,000 years later. The sentence doesn't make sense. They didn't enter Sweden, you know, it, it wasn't there for 10,000 years. But hooray, let's project this contemporary political structure Sweden on the flipping Ice Age, where there was just, I don't know, rocks and reindeer and moss there. <laughs> Vikings were diverse, according to our, con our conceptions of diversity, which they totally didn't have, but hooray! So there's almost a complicity and honor among thieves between these outright conspiracy losers that you see on the internet uh, and the highest profile international scholars who just have a very vested uh, uh, interest in sort of overlooking uh, the fact that you can't project on the past like that. The, the, these, they might be disagreeing on the content, content wh whether Vikings were like woke, diversity-loving multiculturalists in a very contemporary sense, or whether they were like outright identitarianists, which is just as a, totally a contemporary construction. Um, but, they, but though they might kind of disagree, fight about the content, they both project exactly the same mis misconception, projecting our notions of identity and cultural po politics on the distant past. In cultural scholarship, it's really undergraduate material when, that, that you can't do that. When, when a leading Viking Age scholar such as Neil Price, he writes about this in his famous book, The Viking Way. Uh, he writes about um, a possibly genetically Sami person in Viking graves. He just states this. Uh, what I'm saying here is an absolute given, just as a little like laying the ground so that we know that we're not complete idiots talking to each other right now, right? <sighs> yeah, so be very careful about projecting our notions of cultural politics from the 2020s on genetics in Viking graves and Sikh tuna and Bika and so on. Viking genetics does not teach us who we are. And that's a point. Here's a point. Who cares? Who cares if North Europeans in the flipping Iron Age were diverse or not? We want to be diverse. We want to be democratic. We don't want to live in sacred kingships uh, like the Vikings. We want to live, believe in liberty and equity. Uh, we don't want to have a noble class uh, at liberty to treat the slave class as livestock, like Vikings did. You know? We want, you know, if you're a decent person, to believe in equal rights for women and men and different sexual orientations and racial and cultural identities and so on. You know, besides kind of boyish, LARPing, Viking-facing cosplay, that some people enjoy to do. But, you know, what use exactly is it that we have of the social organization of Iron Age Northern Europeans who had like axes and earls and human sacrifices and stuff, you know? <laughs> so when we engage the past, 
When we engage the past, we should not be looking for these entire package of cultural and social politics, belief practice, where everything just is stitched together and fits together. For exactly this reason, sane people do not want to move into the Iron Age. Sane people do not want to move into the Iron Age. Try to think in, in, inside yourself, do you want to move into the Iron Age? If your answer is yes, you probably don't have a realistic assessment of the Iron Age, right? And this is also not how culture works. Culture is not these total coherent packages where everything is fits together. It is absolutely normal, organic, standard human behavior to dialogue selectively and creatively with the past when you're producing traditional uh, knowledge in, uh, in one at a time, contemporary traditional knowledge. The traditional knowledge is something that moves and grows with time. Uh, and and it, it moves through this kind of dialoguing, through mixing with stuff that comes from cultural others, creolization, self-reflection, what is our own history and all these things. And I'm just going to give you one example of this kind of uh, dialoguing and, and, and how I think it, it can work, right? uh, specifically related with uh, ancestry. In the Eric Lay, the Rieks Thula, the god Heimdall probably, lays the foundation for a kind of class society by ancestry. He begets the classes. Now, note, note that he doesn't father different ethnicities, uh, but different social classes. And already here there's a kind of a different idea of ancestry to this ethnic one that, uh, for instance, all these gene testing companies are peddling, and which is very common today. People think in terms of ethnicity when they think ancestry. Right? People in the context where the Riksthule was composed, however, uh, they, prob they probably also had ethnicities and they would, you know, I don't know, call themselves Danes or Norwegians or whatever, uh, but, uh, but they, they seem to have thought of ancestry in different terms. Um, so then ancestry was about social class, actually. And this is also the idea of ancestry that you see, we see reflected in the opening verse of the Voldespa, which goes, Jolsby the Galar, Helgar Kindir, Meiri Mini Mogu Heimdallar. I call you to listen all holy kinship lines of Heimdall, high and low. It's high and low, it's not black and white, or Sami and Norse, or Dane and Irish, or something like that. Um, so they, they, they likely had, had strong ideas of biological descent and kinship, uh, but I suspect if you went and looked at it, you'll probably find a way, weight not so much in ethnicity like we, we tend to think today, but probably more in stuff like a name belonging to a specific kinship line that defines your uh, level in society somehow. A uh, clan that you know, has a certain uh, level. And I think we see, and this is a little bit speculative, I think we see a kind of feudalist uh, culture, a similar kind of feudalist culture in contemporary um, royals and monarchs. It's not something I've studied in detail, but I suspect that the way that contemporary royals think of ancestry is somewhat similar to the culture that produced the uh, Riksthula. Uh, they're very nationally, ethnically, and racially actually transgressive. Uh, the monarchy uh, institution is, uh, if you ask me, is very much not racist. I would even argue that it's, it has a aspects of being non-nationalists because nationalism has emerged actually as a response to the displacement of monarchy. Uh, but this is kind of a longer story. Uh, anyway, uh, in, in both Denmark and England, for instance, you see these high-level uh, royals, like core royals, who marry non-white non people. It's absolutely uh, thinkable to have non-whites as monarchs of these North, North uh, European countries. Not unthinkable at all. These are people who uh, live their lives according to very, very strict social norms. And this appears uh, fully aligned with uh, the overwhelmingly important descent logic that defines these people. Perhaps the most descent-defined persons of our whole society. Uh, there's not any contradiction at all between, uh, between this descent logic that they live by and the fact that a contemporary prince of Denmark, exactly like Harold Bluetooth, he has no problem at all marrying a distinguished sort of Chinese business lady, 
no problem at all. But you can be sure that you wouldn't see him marrying like a kind of a white trashy Danish woman with like bleached blonde hair and silicone boobies and chewing chewing gum and speaking in a like working class social act. So, so this is a kind of classism, it's not racism. So uh, it probably has its own chauvinist aspects, it definitely has. And I suspect that it's kind of a, a leftover of this uh, 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 notions of dissent that, uh, that we know from the past, uh, that we find among royals. It's something that you probably also find among uh, uh, nobles and so on in, in the past. And I'm not arguing for any kind of monarchy here, by the way. I'm just noting that this aspect of this institution seems to reflect earlier pre-modern ideas. Right, so if we go back to this kind of social class descent that we see in the in the Riks Thula, uh, then if we're drawn to Nordic heritage, then one option could be to go, oh, that's so cool. I would so love a social order that's based on sacred kingship and where there was different laws for nobles and slaves. How cool would that be? You know, or you can just dig a teeny tiny bit deeper and say, oh, Heimdall seems to be associated with the social order of human community. He's a guardian an ancestor, an originator of the structure of human life, the structuring of human life. And this, by the way, is how all humans operate with, with old uh, texts and knowledge that, that's uh, sacred to them. You dialogue with it into different ages, right? So what Heimdall uh, means today, you know, what does he mean today? Well, if he, the guardian, the guardian of our social structure, then what does that mean? If he's the guardian of our social structure, what does that mean today? And, uh, well, today, nobody remotely sane, of course, would, would want a social structure where there are nobles and slaves living under different law. But if Heimdall represents a social structure as such, would he not also represent our social structure? You know, which is also uh, an organization of society uh, according to social valid values, just as the uh, society uh, of the Riks Thula uh, was organized according to social values. We just have different social values today. Heimdall, the guardian, represents perhaps the upholding of categories that define and structure our world. So perhaps it would be a reduction of what he is to say that he only represents this uh, kind of feudalist so social order. Um, and, it, 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 you know, if, if it makes sense to look at Heimdall as a, as a figure associated with our reality today. So, so you see, what I'm doing here is not projecting my social idea on the society of the, uh, the Rikstula. I'm not saying, oh, so Heimdall also meant class emancipation and race equity and LGBTQIA empowerment in the Iron Age class society. He probably most likely didn't. It would be pseudoscience, like all those t people talking about Vikings being uh, white or uh, being diverse or not diverse and, uh, and uh, applying our idea of culture also on them. There's a lot of people doing. So what I'm doing here is that I'm using a piece of traditional knowledge based on dialoguing to unpack the story of Heimdall into our age. And that is a very real thing to do. Heimdall gives meaning to our relation making today. And this, this, is, a, this is myth weaving. This is using a myth today, bringing it into dialogue and using it to, to narrate ourselves in a way that uh, prevents us falling into nonsense, actually, like conspiracy theories that are really uh, dysfunctional ways of ascribing subjectivity and intention to stuff, D dysfunctional mythologies, uh, as I've been talking about in a couple of videos. Um, Heimdall, as a Rieks Thula ancestor, here is a way that I ascribe subjectivity and attention to our social organization today. In a sense, this understanding of Heimdall is more real, actually, in, in, I think in a philosophical sense, uh, than, for instance, a scholarly analysis of the very distant past, because that can be really, really ethereal. 
our assertions inside our minds about the probability with which we may hypothesize that specific communities in the very, very distant past had a certain currency inside their minds of specific cultural imaginations that we imagine that they imagined, and so on. You know, you see, it's very abstract and ethereal. But when we engage traditional knowledge through dialoguing, then we can move around this and we can, we can work with it in much more direct ways. And I would say ways that are, in a sense, much more real. Yes, we have a social uh, organization uh, today, you know, and perhaps that has a root in. It descends from Heimdall, the god of the rainbow, bow, you know, who both guards and opens roads between worlds, between categories, an ancestor. This is just one example of how we can think with ancestry today. Uh, so uh, yeah, I hope uh, I'll be able to spare you any more rants about this. And in the following videos in this ancestor series, uh, I think uh, I, I will do some uh, some of the reflections that uh, point away towards what I think I'll hype myself up to calling decolonizing our known notions of ancestry. Uh, and uh, we can find, you know, so, so we can put ancestry into a place in animist perceptions uh, where I think the, the notions of ancestors and the dead uh, can, can take up their, I think, rather important uh, role, as, as it was noted in, in that Facebook group by uh, my friend uh, Dr. Matthias Norvig, um, that, that we can perhaps understand uh, our being in kinship with the world through this category of descent. Our genealogy is something about how we are tied in with the world, and it is a really important part of animism. Uh, but it has been horribly thwarted by uh, modernist ways of thinking with genealogy and ancestry. And it's these modernist ways of thinking that you see um, kind of developed in, in, uh, in ways of thinking such as nationalism and racism. Cool. So this being out of the way, in the coming video I will uh, look a little bit at Nordic sources on ancestry and death cult uh, and what they say and I'll start comparing this to uh, African notions of the dead. Great. Thanks a lot for listening.